Hello everyone, I wanted to discuss these rules here and show you a, a sort of demo game. Um, World War II air combat rules called Lacquered Coffins by Tom Jensen. Now, um, I first came across these rules a few years ago now. A friend of mine and I used to play uh, Check Your Six. Um, which is a hex-based aerial combat game and he was sent a sample um, for review of these rules um, PDF copy and we had a game of it and really enjoyed it really enjoyed the game and I've always had it in mind you know that when I got some planes of my own together which I have now just done um, I would play these rules so I purchased them some time back um, when when I got the uh, plastic soldier company's uh, grab bag of, of planes but I've only, as I say I've only just got around to painting some of those up so um, I thought I would show you these rules because I think they're really interesting and give you a demo game just so you can see now um, the there are a couple of things um, that um, I would criticize about these rules they're not, nothing serious just really um, you know it might explain why they're not so well known as they as they should be um, the first is the title lacquered coffins um, it doesn't really mean anything to most people. I had never heard the term before. Um, it's actually a reference to the way Russian fighter pilots described um, one of their planes. And um, it's pretty obscure, I would say. It make, I mean, most, most World War II air combat games you can think of, like Check Your Six, Blood Red Skies, um, Wings of Glory, there's a World War II version of that, um, Bag the Hun, or they, they all kind of immediately tell you that the game is about World War II or aerial combat. Um, Lack of Coffins doesn't to me, and um, you know, I, th I think people would skip past the title rather than um, pay attention to it, you know, if they're looking for World War II aerial combat rules um, so it, you know it's a little bit too obscure and maybe perhaps a bit bit kind of too too clever for its own and good and if you did if you were familiar with the term then the next thing you would probably the mistake you would probably make would be to think that the rules were confined to the Eastern Front um, in World War two and they're not they're, they're for any theater any period of World War two. Um, so that would be my first um, suggestion possibly rather than criticism that he, he, he could have chosen a, a better title for it um, the, the other thing is that he, he has got he has got a sort of small YouTube channel and he put up a demo game on that about five years ago um, you know it's worth watching to get an idea of how the rules work but um, it wasn't you know, again, <laughs> if I try to be uh, sort of uh, gentle, gently criticise it, it wasn't the best quality, um, uh, you know, video in terms of um, it's played on a, a board rather than a mat. So it's just a plain wooden surface and he uses um, models that aren't, um, you know, suitable really. He uses... Um, for instance, sop with camels to represent swordfish and things like that. So, um, you know, I think that both those things are likely to put people off before they've even started. And the, and it's a shame because these are very good rules. Um, now, as I say, uh, oops, sorry, I'm not in the camera. As I say, it's um, any theatre. So you have at the back of the book... Um, stats for Italian Air Force, Japanese, uh, USA, uh, Britain and Germany, obviously Soviet Air Forces, um, the Luftwaffe, yeah, I said German already. Um, 
and it gives you kind of a breakdown of the um, planes that you can you know that you could use um, description of their type and the points value the weapons they carried and the the, the um, qualities that they might have um, in, in, in re with reference to these rules but if you have something else in mind there is a an explanation of how the point system works and you can um, you know work out what your strange plane that you might be flying with um, or, d or different country um, you know what how much that plane would cost to play in the game um, it can be played uh, on land or sea um, ground targets are, are quite um, important in the game it's not just um, planes versus planes it's uh, objectives on the ground um, na you know naval uh, targets as well so um, you could have games where um, you know Japanese are trying to torpedo play uh, boats or ships or something like that um, so there's a great deal of variety in it. Um, in terms of scale, it's intended for one six hundredth scale aircraft, and um, he says you can use anything up to one one four four. So I use my one three hundredth scale um, models, and that works fine. Um, it is. It would be a problem at um, larger scales than that though because one of the uh, it's, it's not hex bakes it's just played on a plane map and one of the mechanics is that in order to turn the <coughs> excuse me the plane um, uses or the player uses a simple kind of school protractor um, so if you had a model if your model was there for instance and it wanted to turn to the uh, to port you would put the protractor beside the base and then and then turn the plane around with the base touching the um, protractor and for every you know every so often depending on the planes uh, agility it will lose speed depending on the number of degrees that it's turned so for a fighter it can turn 90 degrees up to 90 degrees without losing any speed but it, for every 90 degrees that it, it passes in its turn it loses one point of speed um, sp speed and altitude are uh, denoted with the use of markers um, so in general um, this does vary uh, to an extent in general the altitude um, can be anything from 1 to 7 and the speed can be anything from sorry 1 to 6 and the speed can be anything from 1 to 7 with very fast planes um, so you denote that I, or I denote it with micro dice blue for altitude and red for speed um, he does say that you can get um, in craft shops you can get markers that people use for knitting and s stitching and so on um, but I looked online and the only ones that I could find were fairly cheap um, uh, ones made in China and that wouldn't have been a problem except that most of the reviews I read um, complained that they didn't actually work um, so they would have been useless um, so I thought I would stick with micro dice um, yeah I didn't explain that very well about the banding but it it, it, it doesn't reference um, a, a denomination in feet or meters or anything like that it's simply an abstract indicator of altitude and equally with the speed, it's not a speed in miles per hour, it's just um, a gradation of the speed. Um, as I say, some planes can't go beyond four without risking damage to the airframe. Um, most 
fighters can't go beyond six, but some can go up to seven without risking uh, damage to their airframe. But I'll show you more of that when we actually play the game. Um, so basically what you do, it's very simple. I'll, I'll talk a lot more about the rules when I come to show you the game, but um, the, the turn is um, broken up into a mandatory move. So for instance, this plane at the moment is moving at a speed of three. So it is compelled at the start of its turn to move double its speed. So it would move six inches. Okay, so let's put it back there so it's still in the camera. So it moves six inches and then um, it can make a number of optional manoeuvres. So it could, for instance, turn, um, it could climb, it could dive one altitude up or down um, without having to test to do that. Um, if it climbs, it loses one speed. If it dives, it gains one speed. Um, but it can, it can also choose to kill the throttle um, so that it, it doesn't gain speed if it dives, for instance. Uh, what else can it do as a, a free move? Um, it can make a positive climb, so in which case it has to continue in a straight line um, and then it will gain one altitude and one speed so all those are available to um, most planes in fact all of them I think I can't remember exactly but um, they're sort of fairly standard things that you can do at the end of your mandatory move um, but then tougher tasks um, then become it becomes necessary to test for them so there are a um, number of tougher tasks listed in the rules here we go so you can make steep climbs and dives um, you can make if you're a fighter you can make offensive or defensive maneuvers so things like um, immelman turns and barrel rolls all that kind of thing um, you need to test and um, the test will the test is on it uses d6 and the test is done by rolling 2d6 and an average pilot would need to get six or above in order to be able to form the test so for instance one of the um, things that you need to do if you wanted to fire at an enemy plane is if you if you fly in a straight line um, and you're not turning and you've got fixed forward guns um, then you can hit um, a target that um, the base of, is is within that sort of a longitudinal axis of the plane um, you can just roll the, your, your dice and see if you've hit the enemy but if you make a turn as one of your kind of optional maneuvers and then you want to do the same thing with a plane over here um, that would require a test because it's harder to uh, maneuver and then f fire at an enemy and in the case of um, fixed forward guns such as the Spitfire has um, you can only fire at a plane that is at the same altitude as yourself or one band higher or lower um, but in order to do that as I say if you've turned you have to test to see if you if you can and then the tuck there are also once you've um, passed the test there are lots of um, well not lots but there are some um, uh, factors that you have to put in such as if it's at long range um, if there's a if for every different every one difference in speed um, you subtract from your dice roll, a uh, few other things. Um, if you're firing cannon, you can add. If you're firing light machine guns, as the Spitfire is, you d you subtract, and then you roll a dice for each weapon that you're rolling. Um, so in the case of the Spitfire, you would roll eight dice because you had eight Browning machine guns, um, and you score 
hits on four and above and the damage you cause is different depending on the number on the dice um, so a four would damage the plane a five would wound the pilot and damage the plane I think or no I think it might just wound the pilot I'd have to look that up again Yeah, five would just wound the pilot, six would damage the aircraft and wound the pilot. Um, and there are, you can roll, it's possible to roll higher than a six because of the modifiers. Um, so seven would cause structural damage to the plane and it would lose altitude and speed and anything over an eight would destroy the plane. Um, the planes have a number of damage points. So Spitfire has only got two damage points. Um, and a pilot can be wounded once but if he's wounded again then he's killed um, so that's that's kind of more or less it I'll, I'll talk a lot more about the game setup and so on when I I show you the game and um, can't think of anything else I want to talk about in the, the rules you know that I can't say during the game so I'll well let's now move to the tabletop right then here we go so I should have said uh, before that the rules are available from War Games Vault. I forgot to mention that. So we're playing on a 6x4 table. Um, theoretically you're supposed to balance the points or at least um, balance them in terms of the scenario that you've selected from the, from the book. Um, I haven't done that. Uh, I want to get all my planes on the table and uh, just basically run through the rules with you. Um, so it's not kind of going to be a competitive game between two players where you um, work out victory points at the end and so on. So it doesn't really matter. Um, and um, you can choose, as say, to play either on land or at sea. So I haven't got a... Um, a, a decent enough uh, mat to play on land at the moment so I'm going to play on one of my naval mats and um, as you can see let's zoom in a little bit on the models to begin with so um, I've set the, jerk, the Luftwaffe up over there um, you dice to see whether the base edge is longitudinal or the long or the short edge of the table and I did do that so um, the planes are going to come on from the long edges of the table um, the deployment zone is within six inches of the table edge if that's the case um, I think it's 15 inches if you're using the short edge. Um, but the idea is to have the opposing uh, planes uh, more than three feet away from one another. Now, uh, as I said, ground targets, etc., are important. Um, so I am using um, one of my models from Cruel Seas, which happens to be 1 300th scale as well. Um, in fact, um, you know, you could use much smaller scale uh, targets to represent your ground ground targets or sea targets, um, and, and you, you probably should do. Um, you know, it's <coughs> again to do with that perspective and so on, and and differences in scale. You know, for footprints, all this kind of thing, but. Um, Again, for the purposes of this game, it's not going to matter too much. Um, other things to say... Uh, oh yeah, I've placed this uh, uh, target on the table, but either either I'm being a bit thick or the walls aren't... You know, this sentence isn't um, particularly well um, written. Uh, I've got to find it now. Uh, 
Oh, yeah. Um, basically, as I said, there's a number of scenarios um, that you can select, and I am playing a defensive counter air scenario. Now, for that one, it says um, the def defending player should roll um, one random ground attack target on the table that it gives you and deploy it within four inches of their deployment zone, not inside, but not within 12 inches of any table edge. Now, I, I, I'm I, um, interpreting that as meaning um, it shouldn't be within 12 inches of the short table edge, um, because obviously if it has to be, if your deployment zone for the long edge is six inches and it has to be within four inches of that, then it's bound to be within 10 inches of the long edge. Um, and it says that it's not allowed within 12 inches of any to any table edge. So I think that's um, been written incorrectly. Um, so anyway, I've got it within four inches of my six inch deployment zone. But um, as you will have noticed, my uh, British planes aren't deployed on the table, but I have put uh, three puffs of cotton wool to represent clouds on the table and that is because in this scenario and in some other scenarios as well um, players are allowed to um, dice a d6 number of clouds put them on the table and then um, break your uh, fleet of aircraft up into groups of up to six planes so I've got six Spitfires so I've broken them into two groups of three and they are going to emerge in ambush from these clouds um, just to show you how that mechanic works so you roll a d6 that's the number of clouds that you put on the table they can't be within the opposing players deployment zone and you have to put a you have to select an altitude for them as well um, so that I've put a blue dice to represent the altitude, which I've put at band four for all of them. Um, and you, you have to dice each turn to see if your planes can emerge from the clouds. So, um, you know, it's not necessarily going to work um, if, you, if you dice badly. And um, you also dice to see which player has the initiative um, so normally you would do that in the case of ambushes I'm not sure how you would um, you know not give the enemy player the initiative because you don't want to emerge from the clouds before um, the opposing player has has moved or I don't, I don't see how that could be possible so um, in this particular game I'm giving the Luftwaffe the the initiative so they will go first every turn um, there are six turns to the game and then you roll on a dice to see if the game continues so let's get going right the uh, the object of the game is obviously for the Stukas to dive bomb the <coughs> the ship I'll explain a bit more about that when they get closer to it and should have said as well that um, all planes at the start of the game begin with an altitude of three and a speed of three. So all I'm going to do off camera now is just move all the planes forward, their mandatory move. OK, so there we are. I've moved all the Luftwaffe models forward six inches because they all began um, at a speed of three. Uh, um, obviously, if you were playing... <laughs> You know, um, normally you'd move each model and then do the the, the mandatory moves and then do the, uh, uh, the manoeuvres um, individually rather than doing all the mandatory moves and then um, and then determine the uh, the manoeuvres you're going to choose. Um, just doing this to try and simplify it a little bit at the beginning of the game. <coughs> now, um, so I'm now going to choose the manoeuvres I want to make um, for all these models and um, it's pretty straightforward. Um, in order to make a climb 
um, or a dive uh, and gain speed which I want to do um, then you have to remain you can't make a turn you have to stay in um, level flight as it were um, so the I want the uh, ME109s to make <coughs> A positive climb and they have an ability uh, called fast climb which means that in a positive climb they gain two altitudes two altitude bands and only lose one speed when executing the climb um, so um, I am going to raise the altitude of all the ME109s from 3 to 5 and that means that their sp speed will go down from 3 to 2. So again I'll just do that off camera to save a little bit of footage time. Right yeah apologies I'm going to make a few errors uh, to be expected as I'm still kind of learning the uh, the rules myself here but um, I, fast climb means in a positive climb they gain two altitude rather than one but they they also gain one speed um, they lose one speed when executing a steep climb which is something different so they gain two altitude and one speed so I put them up to five all the ME109s up to five altitude and four speed now with the Stukas, I want them to climb as well. Um, they are they can only dive bomb from an altitude of either three or four. So I want them to go up to four, just in case they lose altitude for other reasons um, as the game goes on and drop below three. Um, but they have a, their quality is slow climb, which means during the positive climb. They only gain one altitude, they don't uh, gain one speed as well. So I'm going to put all their altitudes up to four, but they will remain on um, speed three. OK, so it's now the British uh, part of the turn. And I should have explained about the clouds as well, is that they are there simply to represent areas that the British can emerge from. Um, they don't affect visibility in the game and they don't affect uh, movement so you don't have to fl fly around the clouds and you can see through them as it were um, so they're, it, it, they're there just sort of as an abstract representation of where the ambush can take place from um, now th again this this I'm not quite sure um, in in terms of the way the rules have been written um, but it says uh, for each group or each individual aircraft roll a d6 each turn including the first on a 4 plus the ambushing aircraft can move out of any cloud on the table at a speed and direction of the controlling player's choice um, so if they can move out what if they don't want to um, you know, make the ambush at that point. What's the point of rolling a dice if you're not intending to even attempt to emerge from the cloud? Um, I don't understand that. But in this case, I do want... So I'm, I've got two groups of three, and I only want one group to emerge. So if I succeed with the first group, I'm not going to roll for the second. I think that's the way I'm going to interpret the rules. Um, rather than obliging, you know, two groups to, to emerge from the uh, the clouds when I don't want them to. So here we go. I'm going to roll roll a dice. I'll try and do it on camera for the first group of three, and it's a one. So I've failed. So I will attempt to get the second group out, and I rolled a five. Um, let's push that into camera so you can see. Right. So. They can emerge at any direction the speed they want. So I'm going to have them emerge um, 
from the clouds in that direction um, at a speed of four let's say so they have to move a mandatory move that way of eight so I'll do that off camera again save a bit of time right there we go I, I changed, changed my mind a little bit and had them emerging in that direction for a reason that will become obvious in a moment so they emerged at speed four so they've moved eight inches and they were at altitude four because the cloud was at altitude four so that was the mandatory part of the move and as I say you would do each normally you would do each model separately before you moved on to the next but I'm now going to do the um, optional uh, move as well um, so for the Spitfire at the end um, he is allowed without testing to turn so he's moving around the arc of the protractor there and I'm going to stop there so he hasn't moved 100, over 180 degrees but he has moved over 90 degrees and that means he would lose um, one speed now Spitfires are powerful so if he wanted he has the ability to absorb one loss of speed um, per turn so he could have remained at speed four sorry it's off camera there. let's zoom in a little bit so you can see so he could have remained at speed four but I don't want him to because he is now um, directly behind this Spitfire here um, so he would be able to line up on him and um, he can he is he's at the same altitude and the same speed as that Spitfire so it's ideal in terms of uh, firing position um, to, to lose that, that point of speed but in order to be able to fire um, he has to now test because he turned um, in the manoeuvre he didn't remain in sort of level flight so on is an average I'm putting making them all the pilots in this game are average um, rather than complicate things anymore so he needs on oh no, a he needs to roll six or above on two d6 and he's just done it um, I should say as well that had he failed um, If the check is failed, the aircraft loses one speed and one altitude. <clears throat> so there is a kind of risk involved, um, you know, in trying to do the tougher tasks. Um, depending on the pilot's skill, he's, he, he, if, he, if, he'd, if he'd fumbled that, then he would have lost uh, one speed and one altitude. And had the Stuka been... Um, had that had he been at uh, one altitude, had had his target, had he flown down to the sea level in order to attack this Stuka, he would have crashed into the sea. Um, so that shows you how you know the dangers of flying and manoeuvring in combat and so on are um, you know can can influence can influence the game. Okay, so. Um, he is able to fire, um, so he's got eight light machine guns. Um, the Stuka um, now has the option of taking evasive action. Um, so again, um, in order to be able to take evasive action, you have to pass the pilot test. So he needs to get six or above. And he does, he gets a nine. So he, he is um, 
at the end of this firing, he is going to have to lose, because he's taking evasive action, he's going to have to lose one altitude. Um, so now what we do is roll eight dice for the... <coughs> Excuse me, a bit throaty today. Um, eight dice for the eight weapons that the Spitfire is carrying. And there is no difference in speed at the moment. Um, the target is going evasive though, so that is one, a minus one modifier. And because these are light machine guns, um, it's another minus one. But fortunately, um, machine guns and light machine guns are long range beyond eight inches, which it isn't. Had it been long range, then that would have been another minus one, which would have been minus three meaning that on a d6 it would have been impossible to hit. So I'm rolling eight dice and I'm needing sixes because it's minus two off the dice. So yeah, I've got quite a few. So two sixes meaning means two damage points off of that Stuka. <clears throat> and I'm denoting damage points with white dice. So the Stuka has three damage points, so it can um, absorb one more damage point, but that will influence its ability to turn and so on. Um, makes it harder for it to manoeuvre because the plane is now damaged and um, it also, the Stukas have uh, a rear firing gun so they are allowed now to f fire defensive fire I'm doing this in sort of detail at the beginning of the game but I will speed up um, and cut things out as as the game goes on. It's just to give you a, a de you know sort of an idea of how the mechanisms work at the beginning. But I will take a lot of shortcuts in future. <coughs> right, so find the find the page. I'll just pause the camera for a moment. Right, so that Stuka has one light machine gun, which is right upper which means it can rear upper beg your pardon which means it can fire anything in a 180 degree arc behind it that isn't below its own altitude and that and the spitfire qualifies so it can roll one dice attempting to hit and again um, the spitfire can choose to go evasive if it's if it wishes but i think it's going to risk risk it and not go evasive and um, to point out as well, this is the only part of the game where um, an aircraft can fire in the enemy's part of the turn. Defensive fire is the only thing you can do um, when you can do that. So the other planes aren't allowed to fire at this point in the turn. So here we go then. So we're all just rolling one dice and um, it's a light machine gun so that's minus one to the dice roll and the target isn't going evasive so I need to get five or a six and get a six yes yeah, so that is um, minus one is uh, results in a five so the pilot is wounded um, so maybe he should have gone evasive Right, so I'm going to put a wound marker on the Spitfire model, and that's the end of the sort of firing 
part of that model's turn. So at this point, the Stuka that went evasive now loses one grade of altitude. Okay, and then uh, I'll move the other two um, Spitfire models off camera now. Okay, so I've moved the second um, Spitfire model and he is now, he, he, um, he turned, uh, did exactly the same thing. So basically he's lost one grade of speed um, just so that he is the same speed as this target here even though he could have chosen to um, you know not lose that because he's a powerful aircraft um, and we're going to roll this exactly the same situation we're going to roll dice now to see um, the outcome of this exchange of fire Okay, so the first thing the Stuka pilot's going to try attempt to go evasive, and it's a five, so he fails, so he hasn't been able to go evasive. So the Spitfire is firing eight dice, um, minus one for uh, the uh, light machine guns, but not minus one for the pilot, the target being having gone evasive. So we need fives or sixes. And yeah, there's lots. So this could be the end of that um, Spitfire. So we've got one, two, three, four, fives. So that's four, four fours effectively, which is four points of damage. And one five, which is the um, pilot wounded so he has been uh, shot out of the sky because he can only take three points of damage now I do wonder I think um, that even so he's still allowed to use defensive firer because he would have been firing at the Spitfire as the Spitfire was firing at him so we're going to roll one dice and again um, the Spitfire is not going to go evasive and we rolled a one, so there's no effect. So that's Stuka is shot out the sky and is removed from the table. Right. Oop. So next up is to move the third Spitfire. Okay, so a mistake I did make, but I just rectified it and rolled sufficiently. But because it, the cost that Spitfire had turned, um, it needed to roll against the ability to allow it to fire. And I'd rolled a 10, so it did. Um, so, as I say, I'm going to be making a few mistakes uh, learning these rules. So now, um, this Spitfire has done a turn that was over 90, but less than 180 degrees. Um, and it's now behind this ME109 here and able to fire at it. Um, in this case, the ME109 is moving at a speed of four. So I would have lost um, a speed band for t going over 90 degrees. But because the Spitfire is a powerful plane, it can absorb one loss. So I am going to use the powerful ability in this case to retain the same speed as the target and now what I have to do which I didn't do in the last uh, with the last Spitfire is to roll against the Spitfire's ability to make sure that he can now fire and he rolls a six so where's the uh, there we go he rolls a six so just enough to be able to fire um, so the ME109 is going to attempt to go evasive and he rolls a 5 so he fails so he can't go evasive um, so in this case there's no question of defensive fire because the um, ME109 hasn't got any forward firing guns so this ambush has actually worked quite well for the, this group of Spitfires um, so they are rolling 8 dice 
Um, minus one for firing light machine guns and nothing else. So there we go. Um, right, so we want fives and sixes and haven't done quite so well there. We just got one six, which is a pilot wound. Yeah, pilot wounded. And by the way, um, that does have an effect um, on pilot checks, so um, it's minus one to pilot checks. Um, we're just going to put a, a wounded marker. On that model there. And that is the end of turn one. Okay, turn two. So, um, in general, I'm going to be moving the um, models one plane at a time from now on. But in the case of the two Stukas that are remaining, um, it's pretty straightforward what I want to do with them. So, the first Stuka here um, is going to move forward six inches, which is its mandatory distance, and do nothing else. So it's remaining at speed three and altitude four, so that's the end of that one's turn. Um, in terms of the damaged one, the damage affects its turning ability um, and nothing else, so it is still able to do a positive climb. So I want to, um, I want it to uh, climb um, one band of altitude to regain the altitude that it lost by doing the um, evasive manoeuvre. So the first thing it has to do is go forward the six inches that it's mandatory um, and then it's going to gain one altitude, sorry not that dice over, so it's going to gain one altitude, so it's going to go back up to four um, but because it's a slow climb aircraft it does with a positive climb it doesn't gain an additional speed so they are now both those stukas are now speed three and altitude four okay what i've decided to do is um these three this group of three me109s here are all going to attempt to perform defensive maneuvers which are tougher tasks so i'll do those um all together um just to make it a little bit more apparent what's going on so to begin with they all have to do their um, individual mandatory moves and they're all moving at speed four which means they all move forward eight inches and they're all at altitude five as well at the moment so we're going to do slightly separate things with each one now though. So the wounded pilot um, is going to attempt to gain separation, which means uh, he moves up to the speed that he's travelling. So up to means he can move up to four inches and then face a new heading. Um, so um, he just basically pivots on the spot after having moved. Where are they? Sorry, off camera. There we go. So this pilot here is going to attempt to do gain separation. So um, he has to roll and he's wounded. Um, so he needs to get seven or higher. And he fails, he gets a six. So having failed to do um, a tougher task, he loses one speed and one altitude. So he goes down to three speed. And four altitude. 
So that's an example there about how being wounded did make a difference. Um, had he been, had he not been wounded, he would have succeeded in that task. Um, okay, so the middle one here now um, is, I think, if you make a defensive manoeuvre, by the way, you can't attack. So um, there's no question of them firing their guns in this turn, these three. Um, so he is going to attempt, I think, um, an Immelman, which is to gain one altitude, lose two speed, and the aircraft pivots 180 degrees on the spot. Um, aircraft with fast climb, which he does have, can choose to gain two altitude instead of one. Um, but I don't think I want to do that because I do eventually want to remain at a similar altitude um, or within one band of the Spitfires. So he's not going to do that. So here we go. So he needs to roll six or above. And he gets a six. So he gains one altitude, so he goes up to Yeah, he couldn't have, he couldn't have gained two altitude anyway, could he? So he go he goes um up to altitude six and his speed goes down from four to two. And he pivots on the spot. So that's had two advantages. One is that um, his altitude is now two bands higher than the Spitfires, which means they couldn't fire at him from that point of view. And the other is that he's now a head-on attack. Um, it would be a head-on attack with the Spitfires, and that is a modifier of minus one. So, um, anyway, so that has, you know, that's a useful defensive manoeuvre. Now the other guy, this chap here, I think yeah, this chap here you can see on the camera, he is going to attempt a wing over, which means he pivots up to 180 degrees on the spot and only loses one speed. So again, needs to roll six or above. Yep, eleven. So pivots a hundred up to 180 degrees, so I don't have to go completely 180 degrees. So I'm going to point him, yeah, it is going to be more or less 180 degrees, and he loses <coughs> one speed, so he remains at altitude five, but he goes down from four speed <coughs> to three speed. Right, so now I've just got to deal with the other two ME109s over there. Okay now in their case um, I think they are going to be a little bit more aggressive and attempt to fire at these Spitfires by turning and firing. Um, because they're going to have to move forward um, it does mean they're going to have to turn kind of over the flight path of these Stukas but there's no possibility of a collision uh, because they're at a higher Altitude, they're at altitude five rather than altitude four. So let's just do that to begin with. So, first one, I'm going to move forward, mandatory distance of eight. And then he is going to turn on the turning circle. And he's going to turn just over 180 degrees. So that means 
he remains at altitude 5 but he loses 2 points of speed but because the ME109 is also powerful he only goes down from 4 to 3 rather than 4 to 2 now he is lined up with um, Spitfire that you can't see at the moment. In fact, you can't even see the, uh, the plane we're talking about. So, just going to measure the distance, and it is 12 inches, just within 12 inches, which is the long range. Um, so. I th don't think this is going to be a very effective fire, but what we'll do is uh, roll some dice just to see um, what effect we have. So in order to be able to fire at the target Spitfire, he needs now to pass a test, and he's rolled an 11. 11. So he's able to do that. So... Um, does the Spitfire want to go evasive? Uh, I think he probably does because he's already wounded. So, but he fails, fails to go evasive. Uh, so the ME one hundred nine is armed with two cannon and two machine guns, not light machine guns. <coughs> so the cannon have a, a range of uh, 20, I think it is, 16 inches. Beyond 12 inches it's considered long range. Um, and the machine guns have a range of 12 inches and beyond 8 inches it's considered long range. So let's fire the machine guns first of all. So, um, per speed to difference, um, they're both moving at speed 3, so there's no modifier for that. The ME109 is um, attacking head-on, um, so that's minus 1. Oh, and by the way, because the Spitfire's got fixed forward guns, it isn't eligible to do defensive fire. You can only do that if you have a gun, a gun that can um, pivot and swivel. Um, so, yeah, minus one for the attacking head-on. The Spitfire isn't going evasive. Um, it is long range, though, for the ma machine guns, so that's minus two. Um, so we've got two dice rolling on a minus two. And that fails, but that gets a four. So that is one damage point on the Spitfire. So he's now wounded and damaged. And then the more powerful cannon, he's got two cannon. Um, again, minus one for attacking head on, but the cannon give you a modifier of plus one and it's just within 12 inches, so it's not long range. So this is straight sixes. No, both failed. That was unlucky. So um, the Spitfire remains in the fight. All right, there we go then. So this is just a, a view of what's happening so far. So this Spitfire has now, he's not only this pilot wounded, but he's now got one damage marker on him. And the only Luftwaffe plane left to move is this chap here. So I'm going to move him forward. First of all, he's eight mandatory inches forward let's try and get this bit more on the camera so you can see what I'm doing so he moves forward 8 inches and then again he is turning doesn't have to worry about these spitfires here I think you can see on the yeah, you can see on the camera because uh, they're at a lower altitude. So he is moving more than 90 and it's just, I'm going to say it's over 180. 
um, it's sort of touch and go to line up with that same Spitfire. So um, it remains at altitude five, but loses two points of speed, um, one of which he can absorb with the powerful ability. So he also goes down to speed three. And he's now able to attempt to take a shot. Just get that all in frame. So this Spitfire here is now attempting to fire at that Spitfire there. And again, in order to turn and fire, needs to pass a pilot test. Six plus. Just does it. Gets a six. Um, so same thing again. Let's just measure the distance. Um, so again, it's just within 12 inches. Um, so exactly the same as before. Um, so there are two cannon. Oh, yeah, does the Spitfire wish to go evasive? And he does, definitely, he's in trouble now. Um, and he passes, so he will go evasive in this case. So there are <coughs> two machine guns firing, so there's no speed difference. It is attacking head on, which is minus one. And the target is going evasive, makes it minus two. So, and it's long range, which is minus three. So the machine guns aren't going to be able to have any effect. Whereas the cannon is uh, minus two for attacking head on and being evasive, um, but plus one for being a cannon, um, which means that it's minus one to the dice roll. So rolling two dice on minus one, and we've got a four there, which is another damage. And the Spitfire already has one damage point, only has two, so that is shot down as well. And as I say, Spitfire, with a fixed forward mounted gun, you can't do any. Um, defensive fire so there's no return fire from the Spitfire so now it is over to the RAF to see how they respond well I think the first thing we're going to do is attempt to get that other group of Spitfires on the table and they are going to attempt to emerge from this cloud here and ambush these two Spit these two ME109s here so they need to get four plus to do that just on one dice they get a six so they're going to come out of that cloud there so i just turn the camera off while I think about this right now try this to see if it this works so the three Spitfires have emerged from this cloud and they have to, they have to be at altitude four because the cloud is altitude four, and they've emerged at speed four, which means they moved eight inches mandatory distance. And now that each one of them can do um, its separate optional manoeuvres, so this Spitfire here is allowed to turn without testing. This is what I like about these rules. It's um, right, so that's over 90 degrees. Um, so he's now lined up with this ME109 here, which is one altitude band higher than him, so um, he can shoot at it. So for moving over 90 degrees. Maybe you can sort of see this on the camera. Yeah, you can. Um, for moving over 90 degrees, he loses one speed, so he drops down to the target speed. Um, because he's powerful, he could reapply that speed, but he doesn't doesn't want to. So he has got a clear shot now at the ME109 at very short range there. Um, 
so the only thing he needs to be able to do is roll um, to pass target test in order to be able to fire. And he does just, they're just, yeah, just getting these rolls is six. Okay, so eight machine gun, eight um, <coughs> grounding machine guns, and the ME109 is going to attempt to go evasive. I think that would be wise. Um, six, he does. Um, I'll just notice though that if he does, he will drop in altitude straight into the. Let's show you this. So if he were to if he were to go evasive, he would next turn be directly in front of that Stuka and the same height, which means they would collide. So, having spotted that, I think I'm allowed um, to use my pilot's judgment and say I'm not going to go evasive. So, the Spitfire is firing eight machine guns, light, <coughs> light machine guns. There is no speed difference, there is no uh, evasive modifier, uh, but there is a minus one for firing light machine guns. So I need fives or sixes. Yeah, th two sixes and one five. So the two fives mean two wounds and two wounds means that pilot is dead, been killed. So that plane comes off the table. I'm really enjoying this. You know, the outcome, it, 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 it's difficult to master the uh, art of manoeuvring and so on, and the outcomes aren't always what you expect. Um, but yeah, another dead pilot. So let's move on to um, this plane here. So he's done his mandatory move. So now I think we are trying we are going to try and line him up to attack this plane here if we can. So that will involve a turn obviously. Over 90 degrees. It's about, yeah, it's just over 90. So the same thing has to be altitude four. Um, loses one point of speed. Could put that back up with powerful ability, but doesn't want to. So again, nice uh, clear shot at that ME109 there. And again, they're um, constricted on being able to go evasive. Uh, because they're flying straight at the Stuka, so the only hope is that the Spitfire fails his pilot test and can't fire his guns. No, he gets a seven. So, eight machine guns, light machine guns. Uh, no speed difference, no evasive, just minus one for the light machine guns. Oh, ah. Should have done a minus one for long range as well. Um, on that previous one. Oh no, I shouldn't, no, of course I shouldn't. It wasn't, it wasn't over long range. This one isn't either. So um, forget that. So fives or sixes we need. And we've got two fives and one four. So the uh, two fives are two points of damage and the pilot is wounded, but the plane can only absorb two points of damage. So again, that's another lost 
plane for the Luftwaffe. British, the last, the trial game I played of this, the British got absolutely slaughtered and now um, they're getting their revenge in this game. I think it's because I've worked out the uh, how to manoeuvre a little bit better. Okay, so we've got that third Spitfire now. So he's already done his uh, mandatory move of eight inches. So I think I'm going to try and get a shot on one of these two planes rather than that one because that one would be a head-on attack so uh, in order to line up with that plane there is less than 90 degrees um, but just noticed that uh, this, can you see here, this plane here is at altitude 6 and this is only at 4. So I am allowed to combine <coughs> um, more than one manoeuvre. So I can attempt to climb as well. Where are we? Aircraft can combine manoeuvres like turns and dives without, with no problem, um, but they must apply any and all speed and altitude changes. So the turn was less than 90 degrees, so it doesn't affect my um, speed. So again, so I, I can do a shallow climb without having to test, so I can gain one altitude, it takes me up to five, which is then one band away from the target, so I can fire at him. Um, but doing a climb like that means I lose one speed, which is just as well because the target's going at two. So I'm now altitude five, speed three. So all I need to do now is test to see if I can fire at the target. Yeah, 11. So I can fire at the target. Um, sorry, pointing. Correctly though. Right, so I've got does the target wish to go evasive? I think he does. Uh, he succeeds, so he will go evasive. So that's probably saved him because um, the range is over eight inches, so it's long range. Um, going evasive, and there is a speed difference of one. So that is three modifiers of minus one, meaning um, I can't get any hits. So this plane here, this plane here was the target. He went evasive. Um, that worked, but he now, because he went evasive, he will lose one altitude band. So he goes down from six to five. And that is the end of turn two. Okay, so it's now turn three, German start. And it doesn't look it on from the camera's perspective, but on the table, it's definitely the case that um, this Stuka here has to move forward six inches because it's going at speed three and that will bring it into collision with this Spitfire here because it's at the same altitude, altitude 
four. So, um, I know what to do about collisions, but I think that will prevent the Stuka from doing any manoeuvring after, after the collision is sorted out. So that's the way I'm going to play it anyway. So, um, on a 5 plus, there has been a collision. Yeah, there's been a collision. Sorry, can you say that? Yeah, 6. So, uh, you roll on the damage table for both aircraft, applying a plus one to both rolls. Um, so, um, if it was armoured, I won't go into that because neither of the planes are armoured. So, let's see what damage has happened to the Stuka first of all. So, we rolled a five. You add one to that is six, which is aircraft damaged and pilot wounded. So he already has two damage points and he can soak up three. So this is another German plane off the table. That due to a collision. Okay, so now the Spitfire has to roll for damage. Six plus one is seven, which is uh, structural damage, lose two altitude and gains two speed each turn. What does that mean? Gains two speed each turn. They will lose two altitude and gain two speed each turn. So I think that means it's falling out of the sky. Cannot make manoeuvres but still makes a mandatory move. Ah, oh, gosh. That's the way I would interpret it. Um, so he loses altitude, goes down to two, and his speed goes up to five. So he's heading into the drink, isn't he? Um, I mean, it's what you'd expect with a seven damage, damage result. Right, okay, so um next thing to do then is to move that other stuka it's mandatory move so it moves forward six and uh Yeah, I think I'm going to, with the Stuka, I'm going to um, not do anything else with him. I mean, it's tempting to kind of try and turn and fire at some of these Spitfires, but um, it's the sole remaining Stuka and it should get on with the task of trying to dive bomb the uh, ship. Right, okay, now think about what to do with the uh, the remaining fighter pilots. Okay, so um, this semi-109 here um, has to make a mandatory move of six inches forward. And then on the screen yeah then he's going to try and turn and attack that spitfire that isn't damaged there 
Um, so, let's see, or maybe even, see what he might even end up firing at that one, I don't know, see how. Uh, a bit awkward to get the protractor in without nudging the bases there. So, um, try and imagine this a little bit. So, that is 90 degrees. Uh, yeah, just go a little bit further and we're going to fire into the side so that won't be a head on attack. So, as we turn, we're going to attempt to fire at that. Spitfire there and uh, he went over 90 degrees so he would lose Oop, sorry now did I just I don't think I did yeah I did I'm not bad over yeah he um, I think sorry I, I knocked the uh, I knocked the dice over there but if I remember it correctly he was at altitude 2 was he Hard to say, I was the altitude for. Oh gosh. My fault. Let's say it was altitude two. So um, he can make a positive climb whilst turning. That would take him up to three. Ah, but he's a fast climb, isn't he? So he can go up to four. <laughs> That'll work. And also gains one speed as a result of doing the positive climb. So I'll take him up to speed four. And then um, he lost one speed for doing the 90 degree turn. So it goes back down to three. Um, if I already factored that in, I wanted to be at speed three, so if I'd already factored that in, he can also kill the throttle. Um, so we're now in range of the right altitude to fire at that Spitfire and going at exactly the same speed, which makes the firing easier. So the only thing we have to check is that he's able to fire his guns, having done all that manoeuvring. At the same time, so he needs to get. Oh, he's wounded, so he needs to get seven plus, and he fails, and that means that he drops um, one speed and one altitude, and he won't get to fire his guns either. Where is he? There we go. So he drops one speed, takes him down to two. And one altitude takes him down to three. Okay, that's him. And then uh, there are two fighters over here. These two fighter here to tell me what to do. So um, it's looking pretty simple decision here uh, that one of them is going to move forward four inches, mandatory, and the other six. And both of them, um, are, both of them are fixed forward guns, but they are still, they are basically both pointing. I think we can allow that one there. They are both pointing at this Spitfire here and won't need to turn or do anything um, in order to. Uh, fire at that plane. Um, both of them are able to 
to gain one speed during level flight. Um, again, as a simple manoeuvre. So I'm definitely going to do that in order to bring them closer. So this goes up to speed three. And this goes up to speed four. So these are head-on attacks. Um, they don't need to test in order to do them because they haven't done any complicated manoeuvring or turning at any rate. Um, so the range for this one is eight inches and that's about seven. Um, so this Spitfire can choose to go evasive and I think it would be wise for him to do so. So let's see. He would have to go evasive for each attack. So we'll start with the uh, the ME109 that's slightly further away and he fails to go evasive there. So the ME109 is firing um, two machine guns and it's not long range. So there is a difference in speed of one, so that is minus one, and the attacking head-on is minus one as well. And the target's not going evasive, so it's minus two off the dice roll. And doesn't score anything with its machine guns, but its cannon is minus one for the speed difference, minus one for head-on, but plus one for the cannon. So that is minus one off the dice roll. And he scores a two, which is nothing, and a five, which is the pilot is wounded. Okay. Right, now for the other attack from the other ME109. So again, the Spitfire can choose to try and go evasive. And he succeeds this time. So um, this, in this case, the speed difference is the speed is identical, so there's no speed difference. <coughs> Attacking head on is minus one, going evasive is minus two, and <laughs> nothing else. So minus two, um, no hits from the machine guns, but with the cannon, it is. Minus one for head on, minus another one for going evasive, but plus one for the cannon, so it's minus one and nothing from the cannon. So the only thing we have to remember to do is that the pilot did manage to go evasive for that second attack, so he drops from four down to three altitude. And that is the end of the Germans part of the turn. So now it's uh, over to the British to see what they can do. Right, so it can get a little bit uh, messy now. So I'll try and do each plane separately. So I'll start off with this wounded pilot here. Now he has to move forward four. Um, and that does bring his base into collision with that plane there, which I think you can see, yeah. But it isn't actually a collision because he is at altitude three and this plane is altitude five. So he's underneath, effectively, the uh, ME109. Um, and then, that was his mandatory move, so then he can, um, do a turn if he wishes and I want him to try and line up can't see it on the camera here but there's uh where are we there we go there's a suitable target here um but I think he's probably going to be out of range so he's just gonna turn on the protractor to there It's um, 
less than 90 degrees so you won't lose any speed or anything like that so he's at speed 4, altitude 3 and he's wounded uh, let's just measure the range see if it's possible oh yeah it is yeah he's within he's 11 inches so he's within range so um, he's going to attempt to fire at that ME109 and uh, he will need to um, they're at the same altitude very different speed though so he's gonna kill the throttle so he goes down to speed three and then um, do a pilot test to see if he can fire needs seven or above because he's wounded and he gets seven so he can fire uh, the target will attempt to go evasive yeah he goes evasive so that probably means that the Spitfire won't be able to hit anything because it's uh, minus one for one speed difference uh, minus two because he's going evasive minus three because it's long range and minus four because it's light machine guns so no joy there but this ME109 in fact it didn't need to bother going evasive but I'll I'll do it now so it's all part of the game so he drops from three altitude down to two right that was the first Spitfire so let's deal next with this guy here. So he has to move forward, mandatory move of six inches because he's going at speed three. Maybe I should remark at this point as well um, that this isn't a game because it's uh, sort of I go, you go. It wouldn't be a very good game when you get masses of planes on the table because you would it's possible to overlook you know sort of models in the flow of play um but this i'm I'm managing to remember everything you know hopefully uh, with this number of planes but any any more than this I think it would begin to get a little bit complicated <coughs> right, so what does he want to do? Uh, I think he is going to go for the other remaining Stuka. Where are we? So this is the guy I've just moved the mandatory move, and he's going to make a run at this final Stuka. Um, so let's have a look, they're at the same altitude and the same speed, so that's ideal. So all he needs to do is a simple turn. Um, line up his guns there, so it's less than 90 degrees so he doesn't lose anything. Um, so the only thing is to test, having turned, to make sure that he can fire. So he needs six or above, and he gets an eight, yeah. Okay, so, um, it's just over eight inches. Um, so the Stuka pilot needs to make up his mind whether or not to go evasive. And I think he will, because he's at altitude four. And if I remember correctly, you can do a dive bomb attack from either altitude four or three. Yeah, four or three. 
Okay, so he's going to roll to see if he can go evasive. And he does. Um, so the Spitfire is firing eight light machine guns. Um, there's no difference in speed. Uh, he is going evasive though, so it's minus one. Um, it's long range is minus two, and it's a light machine gun is minus three. So going evasive has spared the um, light machine gun. Uh, but he can, the Stuka is entitled to some defensive fire with his rear facing um, machine gun, light machine gun. So again, the Spitfire itself can choose to go evasive or not. And uh, you know what, I think he will. Because if he succeeds, that will drop him down to the same altitude as the Stuka. So he does succeed. So um, there is a no speed difference. Target going evasive is minus one. Long range is minus two, light machine gun is minus three. So the same situation between the two of them. So the Spitfire successfully went evasive, so drops down to three. And the Stuka has successfully gone evasive, so he drops down to three. Right, so still got three more Spitfires to deal with. Um, might as well do this uh, structurally damaged one. So he basically moves forward 10 inches now because he's going, he's crashing, he's going forward 10. He's not going to collide with anything, but he's out. He's going to lose another two altitude, so he crashes into the sea, and he's lost. Um, so we've got two more Spitfires to deal with. Um, No, we haven't got one more Spitfire to deal with. Yeah, this guy here. Uh, yeah, my mind's getting fogged now. I can't remember if I've moved this guy or not this turn. Don't think I have. I don't think I have. Oh, let's, blow it. let's give him a free turn anyway. So he has to move forward six. And then, I think he's still in camera shot, isn't he? Yeah. So I've moved him forward six, and he's now going to attempt to turn and fire at the Stuka. Uh, so I'll show, I'm going to show you another ability here now. Um, in these rules, the, the Spitfire has an ability called Nimble, which gives him a tighter turning circle <coughs> than the ME109. Now, I've just recently reread um, Len Dayton's Fighter, and in that, he says that the ME109 actually had a tighter turning circle than the Spitfire, um, but in practice, the Luftwaffe were less uh, liable to test the structural, the, the strength of the, the plane's wings, so they tended to turn to turn less tightly than the Spitfire, but theoretically, technically, they were capable of turning in a tight circle. But anyway, so um, let's show you what happens. So he's flying round, he goes beyond 90, and then when he gets to about there, you can still see this on the camera. Yeah, when he gets to about there, 
rather than um, continuing to lose speed, um, which he's not going to do, by the way, because he's going to use his powerful ability to prevent himself dropping speed, he's, uh, his, the nimble ability just allows him to pivot on the spot like that. So he's now, because he moved over 90, he's allowed to use nimble. And he's now pointing directly at the Stuka, um, at one altitude higher, which is fine, and the same speed. So he can now take a shot at the Stuka. I'm hoping that I haven't given you this guy two goes, but I don't, I don't think I did. Apologies if that's the case. Um, right, so he's turning and attempting to fire, so he has to pass a pilot test which he does, gets a seven, and he's firing, it's within eight inches, so it's not like, not long range. Um, the Stuka pilot could choose to go evasive, um, but if he does, he will drop down to altitude two, and that will make him, he'll have to climb again in order to make a dive bombing attack on the ship, so he's not gonna get attempt to go evasive. Um, there is no speed difference, uh, it's not long range, but it is a light machine gun, so it's minus one to the dice roll. Um, eight dice at minus one. Oh, um, mega. I don't know if you can see all those. So there's three sixes and one five, so. That will go down to one, four, and three fives, and five is pilot wounded, two wounds, and you're dead. Um, so it's uh, goodbye to that last Stuka. Um, he can do some defensive firing though, as he as he's shot down. So. Um, does the Spitfire wish to go evasive? I would say yes, but he fails. Um, so the Stuka had one rear facing, rear upward facing <coughs> light machine gun. Um, there's no difference in speed. Um, it's a light machine gun, so it's minus one. Um, so two minus one is one which is no effect so we'll just take this sneaker away as well so the British are coming out on top in this game definitely right and then finally there's this Spitfire here to deal with so um, he's at speed three so he has to make a mandatory move forward of six inches Um, which has taken him off camera, hasn't it? There we go. So he's made his mandatory move, and now he's going to take a shot. He's going to try and line up with one of these two here. So he's at altitude five. They're both at altitude five, and he's at speed three. And there's one at speed three and one at speed four. So he's going to attempt to try and shoot at this guy here. <coughs> um, so it's a lot less than 90 degrees in order to line up. So it doesn't lose any speed from that point of view. So all he has to do is to roll on a pilot test to make sure he can fire. And he does, gets a nine. So the ME109 will attempt to go evasive, which he does, succeeds. So um, that's within eight inches, I'm sure. So four, sorry, eight light machine guns, no speed difference. Um, target going evasive is minus one and light machine gun is minus one so it's minus two off of this so i need sixes to get anything 
Oh. Right, so there's only one six, which is um, that will go down to four, which is aircraft damaged. So this ME109 here is damaged and because he successfully went evasive his altitude will drop from 5 down to 4 if I can find it. There we go. Um, and that is the end of the British planes movement so it's the end of turn 3 so now we're on to turn 4. Right, turn four. The Luftwaffe have three remaining planes on the table, which is a bit of a shame because uh, there are no stukas left, so I'm not going to be able to show you how dive bombing is resolved. Um, it's pretty straightforward, but uh, it's good fun. Um, so we'll start off with this damaged plane here, um, which is going at speed three, so it needs to take a mandatory move forward of six inches. Because he's damaged, um, it means that he will lose speed when he turns more than 60 degrees rather than, than 90 degrees for a fighter. Um, but I do want him to sort of try and turn and line up to fire at this Spitfire here. So um, let's see how many that will take. Uh, so that's. 90, 180, um, I think he needs to go just beyond 180, so he's gone, that's three um, speed losses, uh, which means that um, he would lose three, but he's a powerful plane, so that would mean he gains one, so he's on one. And then he's going to drop altitude from four down to three, um, which means he'll pick up another speed. So he's now at speed two. Okay, so he's one speed difference from his target, which is kind of hopeful. So he needs to pass a pilot test which he does, he rolls a six, so he can fire and uh, it's short range for both his cannon and his um, machine guns, but the Spitfire pilot I think will very sensibly attempt to go evasive and he fails to do so. So the um, the result of that, we fire the machine guns first of all. Um, minus one for a speed difference. And that is all, because these are machine guns, not light machine guns. <coughs> so minus one off of two dice. Nothing. Um, and then the cannon is minus one for the speed difference, but plus one for the cannon. So normals, normal roll, and nothing again, I was really unlucky, yeah, very unlucky from the Messerschmitt's point of view. Okay, that was the first attack, first plane, so let's try and do something similar with this ME109 here. So he has to move forward, he's going at speed 4, so he needs to move forward 8 inches. He uh, will also turn to face the Spitfire, line up with the Spitfire.
That's one. I think it's just slightly under two, uh, under 180 degrees. So he's only moved beyond 90 degrees. Um, so he will lose one speed. The reason I'm kind of hesitating there, I was think, looking at this situation here and I think this counts as a friendly in the way because in all fairness I think the the firing line just cuts the edge of this plane's base and this plane is at the same altitude um, as as the target um, so yeah while I'm about it though I'm going to drop this altitude down to um, four doesn't make any difference, which means he'll pick up one speed there. Um, yeah, I th I think that counts as a friendly being in the way. So if there's a, if there's a friendly base at the same altitude as the firer or at the, as the target, then the uh, firer is inhibited from firing. So I don't think he'll get to um, make a shot. I suppose, yeah, let's be a little bit cheesy about this and turn him even further. So he will then lose another point of speed. Farming sounds slightly further and he, he is going to take a shot at this guy here, which is legit. Um, OK, so... Uh, and that is just over eight inches. Right, so in order to fire, he needs to pass a pilot test. And he does, he gets a six. So he just passes. Um, the Spitfire will try to go evasive, which he does, he succeeds. So to begin with, the M1 and I is firing its machine guns, so there is no difference in speed. Um, minus one for the target going evasive, and um, minus one for it being long range. So it's minus two off of two dice. Need sixes then, no. And then the cannon is minus one for being evasive. It's not long range, however, now, and it's plus one for being cannon. Um, so that's zero. So straight up dice and a six. Yeah, so six is aircraft damaged and pilot wounded. And because, as you can see, he is already wounded once, that kills him. So a little bit of payback for the Luftwaffe. Right, and then finally, we've got this uh, third ME109 here to move. Um, so he's going at speed two at the moment. So he has to move forward four. And then... <coughs> um, he's at altitude two, and... Um, the only close uh, plane in terms of altitude is off camera there, just like that one there. Um, that's at three. The other two Spitfires are um, altitudes five and four. Just notice as well, it's three against three now. <laughs> uh, so I think he's only going slowly, so he can't really do much. So he's going to make a, a powered climb, I think, to try and uh, try and regain some height and advantage. So a positive climb, I mean. 
So being um, a fast climb, he doesn't have to test for this, he just has to keep flying in a straight line, which he has done, and he gains one speed and two altitude. So he gains up, goes up to four. And one speed, take him up to three. Right then, so British turn now, so um, might as well start with this plane here. So he needs to move forward six inches. And he will turn to try and fire at one of these two planes here. So it's less than 90 degrees. But he will kill the throttle so that he's going at the same speed as the target one which is this so this will be a head-on attack a head-on attack is anything in in the forward 180 degree arc um, that's coming towards you in a similar 180 degree arc so that it, that still does count as a head-on attack even though they're not flying directly at, towards one another <coughs> um, so all he needs to do then oh he needs to drop his altitude because he's at five and the target is at three. Um, so go down to four altitude. And that means his speed will um, pick up to one, pick up one to three. So there is a slight speed difference now. And then test to see if he can fire. He can, uh, so at the moment there's one speed difference, one for head-on attack and one for light machine guns, so it's minus three anyway without the target even going evasive, so there's no point in the target going evasive because he won't be able to hit with anything. So that's the first Spitfire's turn over. Um, then we'll deal with this one here. Uh, so he is moving at three, so he has to move forward six inches. And then his only suitable target really is this guy here. So he needs to turn to line up his guns. So the Spitfire's altitude three, the Messerschmitt altitude four, so that's fine. And uh, they're both going at the same speed. So, because he turned, needs to make sure he can Pass the test, and he fails, so he, he can't fire his guns. And then finally, there is, where's it gone? This Spitfire here. Uh, he moves forward mandatory six inches. So that almost, means the bases are touching but it wouldn't have been a collision because one plane is at altitude 4 and the other at altitude 3 so they would fly over one another or one over one under um, so again I'm going to try and move Yeah, 
I'm just because the bases are colliding now I'm just going to turn him a little bit that way but then you've got the same issue um, that uh, this plane can't fire at the ME109 because um, oh hang on Yeah, it's if the target or the firer is at the same altitude as the intervening plane. And the intervening plane is at altitude 3, but both the fire and the target are at altitude 4, so he can fire. So, let's do a test. And he passes, yeah, so he can fire. Um, the ME109 will attempt to go evasive and he fails because he only gets a 5 and he would have needed 7 because he's wounded. Um, <clears throat> so the ME1, the, sorry, the Spitfire is firing 8 Browning. Um, there is no difference in speed. The target isn't going evasive. It's not long range, but it is light machine guns. So minus one off of the dice rolls. So fives and sixes we need. And I haven't done brilliantly. We've got one six, which goes down to a five, which is the pilot wounded. And again, as you can see, the ME109 pilot is already wounded, which means he's now killed. Okay, so that was the end of turn four, so we're now on to turn five. And there are two German planes left against three British. So there are the two German ME109s. And... Uh, Let's do the mandatory moves, or the mandatory move on one of them first of all. So the damaged plane is moving at speed 2, which means he has to move forward 4. And then <coughs> it seems pretty obvious that what he wants to do is to line up with one of these two here. Try and fire at the the lead plane there. Um, that wasn't more than a sixty degree in his case turn, so he doesn't lose any speed. Uh, but he has turned slightly, so he will need to roll in a pilot test to see if he can fire. And he fails because he gets five, so he can't fire. So now it's over to the second ME109 remaining here now. He's moving at speed three, so he has to move forward six inches. Narrowly avoiding colliding with the Spitfire, which is at the same altitude as him. Um, so again, if you can get him to turn and fire at one of those two Spitfires there. So it's getting a bit difficult to get the protractor in. But it's only a very slight turn there, so no loss of speed. Has turned though, so he needs to check to see if he can fire, and he fails. So the Germans are really getting outclassed now. So now it's the British 
uh, part of turn five. Right, so this Spitfire here, moving at speed three, so it needs to go forward six inches. And then we'll turn. So he's going to go over 90. Losing him one speed, which he will then, um, oh no he won't, he will drop that speed because his target is going at two as well. And then he will use his nimble ability to pivot so that he's firing at this MV109 here. So he needs to roll to check he can do that. Six, just done it. Um, okay, so I think the ME109s would be wise to try and go evasive. And he succeeds, so he will go evasive. So there are eight machine guns, um, no speed difference. But minus one for going evasive and minus one for light machine guns. So only sixes are going to hit. And there are no sixes there. So no hits, but this ME109 will drop from altitude three to altitude two because it successfully went evasive. Uh, and then there are these two Spitfires here to move. Um, so I could do them in any order. So the first one easier to deal with moves forward six. Is going to turn so it's over 90, which then allows him to use the nimble ability, but um, I think he's going to be out of range. You still see that on the camera? I'm not sure. Um, yeah, it's outside of 12. So he went over 90, would have lost speed, but gained it again because of the powerful ability. Um, so no change in speed or anything like that. Just doesn't, um, doesn't get a shot off this turn. And then the other remaining Spitfire is travelling at speed three as well. Slightly different altitude from the other one there. So he will do the same thing because he's different altitude, he doesn't climb with his uh, associated Spitfire. So he's gone over 90 and then he pivots with the nimble ability. And that is just within 12 inches. Sorry, didn't have the camera quite. So he's pivoted. He went over 90, so he lost one speed, but the powerful ability allows him to soak up that loss of speed. Um, and he can get a shot in on this mesh bit here. But he just has to pass a pilot test to do so. And he fails, so he can't get a shot off. I think it would have been pretty hard shot anyway, because um, long range light machine gun and head on, it would have been minus three, so he wouldn't have succeeded anyway. 
Um, so that marks the end of turn five. Okay, turn six. And uh, got two German planes left in the game. Um, the first one, the damaged one, is moving at speed two. So he has to make a mandatory move of four inches forward. And costs his altitude two. I think you can see all this on the camera. Um, this rear Spitfire is altitude three. And the forward one is at altitude four. So he's going to aim at the, try and get hit on the Spitfire altitude three. So um, he's damaged. So he turns more than 60 degrees, which means that he loses um, one speed. So he's down to one. So in danger of stalling and uh, oh yeah that's something I've been um, forgetting to do I think I have anyway Yeah, so um, the, this is a tougher task, and I think on occasion I have forgotten to, um, if they fail, like just in turn five there were a couple of failures, and they all failed, I, all, I forgot to, that once they fail, they should drop one altitude. Um, so he risks, if he's now at... Um, Altitude two and speed one, so he'd be all right. Yeah, he'd be all right. Um, he, he would drop down to altitude one if he fails this test, but I think we'll risk it. Okay, but if he does fail, um, oh, well, it doesn't matter if he fails, he won't be able to fire at the plane anyway. But he's passed, well, 10. So he can fire at the Spitfire, which is in within eight inches. So he's uh, does the Spitfire wish to go evasive? I think so. And he succeeds. So the machine guns, two machine guns. Um, there, oh, this is useless. There's two speed difference and evasive. Uh, Uh, two speed difference is minus two, evasive is minus three, and it's not long range, so it was worth going evasive. Yeah, but minus three means he can't hit with his machine guns. But the cannon is minus two for the speed difference, minus three for the evasive, but plus one for the cannon, so it's minus two. So we need sixes, and we don't get it. A five and a four. So um, that, that Spitfire there successfully went evasive, so he drops from altitude three to altitude two. It's quite nice how this is working because you know planes would lose altitude as they manoeuvred and fought one another. So I, th I think these rules are very well written, well constructed, and designed. Um, so we've now got. The second surviving ME109 to move, so it goes, it's moving at speed three, so it goes forward six inches. And then, because it's at the same altitude as this plane here, which you can see, yeah, it's going to try and turn and. Um, Fire at that. There's no risk of him hitting this plane, uh, and he's not damaged, so he needs to go just. That's a pain. It's almost in the same spot, so I'll just have to move him slightly, so the bases aren't on top of one another. 
Um, but as I say, he's not colliding because he's too advanced higher in altitude. Okay, so he... Where are we? Yeah, this plane here is going to turn, has turned and he's going to fire at that plane there. Um, he went more than 90 degrees, but he's powerful. So he's not going to drop speed, so he retains the same speed difference as that one. Um, he does need to roll, though, to see if he can fire. Yep, he does. Um, so the Spitfire will attempt to go evasive, and he fails. So. The ME109 to begin with will fire the machine guns, so there's no difference in speed. It is head on, so that's minus one, um, so just minus one because it's not long range. The machine guns, fire, the five will go down to four, which is one damage. This could be deadly. The cannon are uh, minus one for being evasive, plus one for cannon. So no modifiers. Ah, oh, and again, really poor dice roll, no hits. So that's the Luftwaffe, and now the British have to move. Right, so first up then, this Spitfire here, we're going to move, so he's moving at speed 2, so he goes forward 4 inches, um, and then he's going to, he's at the same altitude as this Messerschmitt here, so he's going to try and turn and fire at him. That doesn't take him beyond 90 degrees, so he doesn't lose speed or anything like that. Um, so all he has to do is pass the pilot test to be able to fire his guns. And he does. Um, the ME109 will attempt to go evasive. And he does. So there are eight machine gun, light machine guns. Uh, minus one for the speed difference in the two planes, minus another one for going evasive, and minus one for being light machine guns. So going evasive saved the ME109. So all we have to do is put his altitude down because he successfully evaded from four to three. And then, um, think about what we're going to do with the other two Spitfires. So we'll do this one first of all. So he has to move forward six, because he's going at speed three. And then he is at the same altitude as that plane there, but I think in turning he won't, his flight stand isn't going to collide. So we'll take the risk, see how good a pilot I am. Yeah, there's no way it would hit. So he's damaged. So he has to move over 90 in order to um, be able to use his nimble ability. So um, because he's damaged, he moves over 60, so he loses, oh gosh, <laughs> one speed, so he goes down from three to two. Um, but because he went over 90, he can now pivot and he needs to be lined up with this M109 here. Um, 
And that's all he needs to do, except to roll to see if he can fire his guns. And he fails. <laughs> okay, so there's one more Spitfire. This chap here. So he has to go forward six. And he is at altitude two, so he's suitable altitude to take a shot at either of those two. So he will turn more than 90, losing him one speed, so he goes down to two. But he's going to use his powerful ability to put that back up to three. And then he's going to pivot. and fire at the already damaged. Everyone in mind there. Pilot check, passes. Um, does the ME109, he's at altitude two, so he can afford to, to go evasive, so he will try. And he succeeds. Um, so there are eight guns. Uh, oh, yeah, rubbish. Speed difference of two. I should maybe have chosen the other target, but never mind. Uh, speed difference of two and uh, evasive is three, so he can't hit. So that is the end of turn five. Was it turn five? No, it was turn six. Um, okay, so we now have to roll to see if the game continues. And it will continue on a three plus six. Yeah, so the game continues. Well, it's a bit desperate for the German side now. Turn seven. Um, this plane is probably in the best position. So it's got slightly more speed and altitude than the other one um, so it's moving at three so it has to go forward six still on screen I don't think it is there we go it's still on six um, three and three and then it will t attempt to turn um, so past 90 um, which one can it line up with? Yeah, I think it will aim at the rear one because it's, I don't want it to go over 180 and lose too much speed. So it's dropped. Um, oh, hang on. It would drop two. Yeah, we'll do that. I'm just moving a little bit further when he's going to aim at the damaged Spitfire because he would drop two speed but powerful would allow him to only drop one so he goes down to two and then he's at the same speed as the damaged Spitfire uh, so uh, I oh, know, yeah, this, this intervening plane might have got in the way and been the target, cause, but he's at altitude two, so um, that's fine. Um, okay, so he just needs to roll to see if he can fire his guns. Eight. So he can. So the range is over eight inches, um, but under 12 or whatever it was for the cannon. So it's over long range for the machine gun. So we'll do those first. Uh, I think the Spitfire will try to go evasive. He does. So there is no speed difference. 
it is head on, it's minus one, and it is evasive, is minus two, and it is long range, is minus three. So the can the uh, machine guns aren't going to hit. Let's do the cannon next then. So um, minus one for attacking head on, minus two for being evasive. Uh, but plus one for being cannon, so it's minus one, and uh, the four will go down to three and miss, so no hits. But that Spitfire successfully went evasive, so he now goes from altitude four to altitude three. And then the other other ME109 is a little bit more difficulty. Um, he's on one altitude and one speed. So I'm going to get him to do a powered cl climb, which is not a um, thing that he has to test for. <clears throat> um, so he has to move forward two inches, first of all, for his mandatory move. And then the powered climb, positive climb, I keep saying power climb, positive climb, he gains one speed, so he goes up to speed two. And because he's fast climb, he goes up from altitude one to altitude three. Um, but that still puts him in the sights of the following Spitfires, but there's not much you can do about that. Okay, so um, there's no risk of the Spitfires colliding because they're all at different altitudes. So um, the damaged one, first of all, uh, no, let's do the fastest one. So it's going to cut across. It won't collide because of the altitude, but it'll just keep the bases out of the way. So it has to go forward six inches. And then turn. More than 90 degrees. Meaning he loses one speed, so it goes down from three to two. And then he went more than 90 degrees, so he can pivot using the nimble ability. And sorry, it's just off screen there. And then he's going to try and fire at the ME109, which is only one band different in altitude, so he has to pass the test. Which he passes. Um, I think the ME109 will try and save himself by going evasive because he's now got some altitude that he can sacrifice. Yeah, so he succeeds. So there are. <clears throat> Eight machine guns firing at him. Um, the speed difference is the same. Um, attacking head on is minus one, evasive is minus two, and light machine guns minus three. So he successfully evaded, but he did drop down in altitude. Down to two. Um, then <clears throat> this one here is travelling at speed two, so he goes forward four inches. Um, I think even with 
Ah, I'll see what we can do. We can have a shot at this guy here. So he turns. It's going to be less than 90 degrees, so he doesn't lose any speed. Um, oh, he was damaged though. So he went more than 60 degrees, so he will lose one speed, but he can soak it up because of his power fill ability, so he retains the same speed. And then he just has to test to see if he can fire his guns. And he fails, so I keep forgetting, but I will now remember that his altitude drops by 3 to 2. So it's always the way when you're doing these demo games that there's something you forget or you remember after the event. Um, but that's what you're supposed to do. So finally, we've got the Spitfire there. So he's travelling at speed 2, so he moves forward 4 inches. Um, he is going to... turn very slightly to face that one, drop in altitude down to three, which will put his speed up to three, but he's going to throttle back to keep it at two, so he's going at the same speed as the target. And then the same again, just needs to test the see if he can fire his guns and he passes. So again, I think the ME109 is going to risk altitude again to uh, go evasive and he passes just. So the, there is no speed difference, minus one for being evasive, minus one for light machine gun. So six is required firing eight guns. And there is one six there. Um, so that means that the pilot is wounded. Okay, so the pilot has now taken a wound and is also went, successfully went evasive, so he's now back down on the floor, sea level at altitude one. And that was all those British firing. So now we have to roll to see if it goes on another turn. And we need to roll four plus for it to continue. Six, yep, so it goes on into turn eight. Right, so turn eight, um, the Germans begin. This pilot is in real trouble now because he's on the deck virtually. Um, he's only altitude one and he's wounded. So um, he needs seven plus to pass a pilot test and if he fails, he will crash into the sea. So for the time being, you can only do things um, that um, he doesn't need to test for, I would say. So he's going to advance um, in level in sort of straight flight. So speed two means he goes forward four. What's on the camera? I don't think it is. There we go. And he's going to do a powered climb because his fast climb means he can climb. Um, oh gosh.
Well, normally he would gain one speed and one altitude. So, but he can, because he's fast climb, he can gain two altitude, means he goes back up to three. Oop. Altitude and three speed. Yeah, the damage only affects the turning ability. I was just checking that it didn't affect the climbing ability. Um, so I think I've done that correctly. And then um, the other lift rougher pilot there. He has to move forward four inches and turn very slightly it's less than 90 degrees so he can now attempt to take a shot at this guy here and um, we'll need to test because he turned. Fouls his test, and therefore, I'm going to remember again this time, he loses one altitude, so he goes down to two. Now back to the British. Uh, let's start. Okay. So <clears throat> he has to move forward four. So I've moved this plane forward four, and then he is at a different altitude from this plane here, so he can do a turn and fly over him. Um, it's just this problem with the bases. So he's going over 90 degrees. So he loses one speed, which he will soak up because he's powerful. And then the nimble allows him to turn like that, so he's face onto that ME109. Um, rolls to see if he can fire his guns, which he can, because he's got seven. <clears throat> um, does the ME109 want to go evasive? I think, yes, he definitely does. And he succeeds. So there are, there is one difference in speed. It's minus one. Attacking head on is minus two. Evasive is minus three. And that machine gun's minus four. So again, I needn't really have bothered going evasive but as I said I would drop his altitude down to two um, so that's the first Spitfire moved right um, this guy here is damaged so I think I'm just going to move him a little um, and not try and turn him too tightly because he's only on a speed two at the moment. Um, so he's got to move forward four inches for the speed. And then I'm going to turn him 
less than 60 degrees. It's just off camera there, sorry. Less than 60 degrees so that he doesn't lose any speed or anything like that. And then finally, we've got this Which one was it? God. <laughs> I think it was this chap here I haven't moved yet. So he goes forward four. Um, he turns. If he does turn, he's going to fly, because he's at the same altitude, he's going to fly straight into that plane there. So, um, ah, let's do an offensive manoeuvre. We haven't done many of those. Okay, so his move forward is um, mandatory distance. So he is now um, Uh, there aren't no, there aren't any um, offensive maneuvers which uh, allow him to make an attack. So he could make a defensive maneuver, but he wouldn't be allowed to attack. Yeah, I think he's going to make a defensive maneuver and not attack. Um, yeah, it's a bit, it's kind of pointless in a way, but it will get him points, pointing in the right direction. So he's going to attempt to make an Immelman turn which means that, oh no, sorry, a wing over, which means he just pivots 180 degrees on the spot and loses one speed, which he can't afford to do. Just notice my battery's running a little bit low, so let's do this quickly. Okay, so he's testing for that. Um, he succeeds. So he loses one speed goes down to one speed and he pivots 180 degrees okay right so that is the end of turn eight so um, we are now going to we need five plus in order for the game to continue five plus yeah so the game is going to go on so I'm going to have to recharge my battery before I continue with this Right then, turn nine, and uh, the the um, Emmy one and nine that's in trouble is going to attempt to gain separation. So he has to move forward six inches anyway for the mandatory move. It's moved off camera, and. Um, Then pass a pilot test, because this is a tougher task. It's a defensive mm. manoeuvre. So he's wounded, so he needs seven or more to pass. And he fails, um, which means it was worth the risk, but didn't pay off. But it means he drops down back to altitude one again. Um, so that's all he can do. But um, Getting a bit desperate, so he had to take the gamble. And then the other ME109 um, is moving at speed two, so he has to go forward four inches. And, oh, gosh. 
I'm not sure whether I just knocked that over or not. Uh, we'll say he's on altitude 3. Um, he will then... Uh, turn... Slightly more than 90 degrees, but powerful plane, so he can soak up that speed loss. And he's going to attempt to fire at this Spitfire here. So he requires a pilot test, which he passes. Um, I think the Spitfire is going to just soak up any damage. Um, rather than go invasive. <clears throat> so um, the ME109 has uh, no speed difference, is attacking head on which is minus one, so it's just minus one so this might have been a bit stupid but let's see what happens. So this is the machine guns first of all and a six minus one is five, so the pilot is wounded. And then the cannons are minus one for attacking head on, um, but plus one for being a 20 millimeter cannon, so evens. And a four is aircraft damaged. So if nothing else, that sort of demonstrates um, you know, the risk you take by not being um, evasive, if you can do. He had plenty of altitude to spare, if he, you know, to drop, and he's ended up wounded and uh, with one damage. So if, you know, only one more and he's be shot out the sky. Um, so I, I, I just think these, uh, for D, you know, with D6 with very little uh, flexibility with the D6 in terms of, you know, the spectrum of dice rolls and so on, it just works. I think these rules work brilliantly, really impressed by them. Okay, so that's the Germans. Um, now on to the British and... Uh, we might as well start with the one that's not really going to have much difference to the game now, which is this chap here. Um, so he has to move forward four inches. And then he's going to turn less than 60 degrees. Can still just about see that. Um, and leave it at that. The other two Spitfires. Um, the wounded chap has to move forward four inches. He is just going to do a powered climb, which he doesn't need to test for. So he gains, um, is he fast climb? I think Spitfires are. Yeah, Spitfires are fast climb. So he gains two altitude, taking him up to five, and one speed, taking him up to three. And then the final Spitfire um, is going to have another shot if he can at that guy in trouble. So he, he's only moving at speed one at the moment. So he moves forward to. Um, he has to make a slight turn in order to line up on the plane. 
it's off, the target's off camera there now. And um, it was turned was a lot less than um, 90 degrees. And then, but he did turn a little bit, so he has to test, to see if he can fire. He can. So it's less than eight inches. Um, the the target now can't go evasive because he's at altitude one, so he can't drop anymore. So he's uh, trapped on the sea level now. So um, eight machine guns. Um, there is a speed difference of two. That's unfortunate. I wonder if the powerful um, allows you to increase speed whilst turning rather than just soak up a speed loss. No, it doesn't. It's only if you've moved over 90 degrees. Right, so there's a two, two speed difference uh, and it's like machine gun is minus one so can't hit the here. So that is the end of turn nine. And now it requires a six plus in order to continue the game. We get a four. So the game is now over. So let's just uh, reflect on the rules. Okay, now I set this game up um, not according to the rules, so um, had unequal points and so on because uh, I wasn't really too bothered about you know representing a competitive game. I wanted to show you and the, the game mechanisms and how it played and so on. Um, but if you were playing a game with an opponent, um, you would tot up victory points at the end of each game um, and Basically, you get victory points um, for the points value of the aircraft pilots and ordnance that you still have on the table. So in other words, by putting a disproportionate number of planes on one side, um, you've affected the victory points at the end. So you need to do that properly if you're going to play, play the game properly. Um, and then you get bonus points for ground attacks. Uh, so the target types that you've hit or there's another scenario where you're taking reconnaissance photos um, you get 10 points for each photo provided the plane survives the the battle um, and then any damaged aircraft um, in order to land after the game and count towards the survived total um, the pilot has to take um, a pilot check in order to land otherwise he's destroyed as well um, and then the specific missions have got um, have got different sort of victory points as well but the, the um, as I say the scenario I was playing was defensive counter air which was to protect a ground target so that could be a surface target if you want to say um, from strategic bombing um, one player will be the attacker attempting to bomb a ground target, the other player will be defending, attempting to defend their ground target. Um, and you're basically meant to randomise your dice throws to determine what the ground targets are and so on. Um, and one thing I wasn't sure about, the attacking player must take at least 50% of their forces as bomber type aircraft. These aircraft will cost half their usual points. So does that mean 50% in number? of planes rather than points because if you're if you're if your aircraft are costing you half their usual points you know i'm not quite sure what that meant are you meant to take 50 percent of your points in bombers and then only pay half the usual cost i don't know but, but i wasn't doing that anyway so there are there are places in these rules i'm trying to say where I'm not entirely clear but it wouldn't take too much to sort them out. Um, I think you probably saw about at the very beginning that um, in the back of the book they have these tokens that you can cut out or photocopy to use for various um, you know sort of uh, 
tokens in the game. I mean, some of them are the ground attack targets and some of them the naval targets. Um, and you can see from here that they are a much smaller um, size than the plane scale, even at 1 600th, they're quite small. Um, I mean, obviously, a, an airfield would be quite massive on a table and very easy to, to bomb for that reason. So you have to have a small area on the table that you're you're trying to to bomb to make it a slightly difficult mission. So there's an issue with scale there, which isn't a problem. You just need to be aware of it. Um, but what the friend of mine that I mentioned, who introduced me to this game first of all, did um, was he was playing um, a sort of Pacific War scenario, where he used um, the top side. He had top side minis tokens for um, World War II American and Japanese fleets. So he, he was using these ones. I forget what scale top side minis are now. Um, the only ones I've got aren't really suitable because they're all World War I uh, vessels. But that is another alternative, I would suggest, to using these cutout tokens. Get, get, pick up some, um, some of these top side minis, which I haven't done anything with in ages. I uh, really need to get around to playing some sort of game with these. Um, but I really, yeah, that's another, that's another subject anyway, top side mint. Um, so that's, that's one idea. But um, again, I apologise for getting some of the rules mistake. I, I, didn't, I didn't get any wrong, I don't think, but I forgot to, do, I forgot to perform some, uh, of, you know, the, I forgot to uh, enforce the compulsory altitude loss, for instance, in, when they failed their tests. And, tougher task tests. Um, so I forgot to do that, but by and large I, I got my head around the walls quite easily. Um, they're pretty easy to pick up. There's an awful lot that you can add in terms of complexity. I think the one thing that my mind wouldn't be able to cope with is having a great number of planes on the table because then it would be easy. It does get a bit messy in terms of um, the planes being all jumbled up on the table and it would get quite easy to forget to move certain planes. There was an occasion where I may, I don't think I did, but I may have moved a Spitfire twice, even in this game. Um, so, it's, I, I, I personally, I would find myself a bit limited just with my capacity to take every model into account. Um, yeah, the, the other thing is, um, you know, it's possible to kind of play these rules as a campaign. Um, because pilots can gain experience so their quality can improve you know if they survive the battle and so on and um, because there's so many different scenario type missions you know you could play through all of those as well so you could you could kind of recreate a, a Battle of Britain campaign for instance um, doesn't, you know, but as I say, it's not. You don't have to set this in the Battle of Britain. There's, there are aircraft types for most of the major nations and uh, all the theatres of war, so you can do what you want with it. But it's it's amenable to campaigns. Um, and the other thing that I really like about it is it's very good solo uh, game. Check your six um, isn't isn't really because you're you're moving the aircraft simultaneously, having written down what their manoeuvres are going to be um, in advance. So obviously if you're playing solo, you're going to know um, what, you're, what the opposite side is doing. Whereas with this, very often you don't even know, you know, it's hard to work out where your plane will end up, you know, even, even in, in terms of giving it orders, um, simply because things can go wrong or you forget to take into account a, a loss of speed or a, a decline in altitude or something like that. Um, it's quite hard to judge whether you've got planes lined up and positioned exactly where you want them anyway. So um, it makes for a very good solo game. Um, and yeah, I really enjoy it. I, I like the fact that they've got the, you know, they've introduced clouds to a certain extent in a very simple way. Just from the point of view of place, you know, places where planes can hide, um, but they don't interfere with the gameplay too much in terms of visibility or movement of planes and so on. Um, 
it's I think it's a really really good set of rules and you know it it's seems you know a pity to me that they're not played more widely or better known but um I hope you enjoyed the video I can certainly recommend the rules uh lack of coffins World War II air combat rules written by Tom Jensen uh, and check out his video channel by the way because he he is a bit of a kind of uh, all-round sort of person but he does you know war game rules creation is just one of his many uh, skills and uh, the, the 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 video on uh, lack of coffins is worth watching just to get a sort of better idea explained by the expert on how to apply the rules but anyway thanks so much for watching see you on the next video bye for now